So hello everyone. Uh, it's just now one o'clock. So we're going to get ready to get started. So today we're going to talk about uh, nest development and talk about checking our nest boxes. So back in January, uh, on our last session on January 9th, I think it was, we deployed our nest boxes. Um, we had this, uh, so we have this experimental design, right, where we've got three nest boxes at each site. We have got a Gilbertson's, uh, North American Bluebird Society design, and the Florida Bluebird Society design. So at each site, we've got three nest boxes, and we're hoping the bluebirds will choose their favorite nest box. And then we're going to monitor how they do in that nest box. So uh, looking at the number of eggs laid um, and uh, growth rate and hatch rate uh, of, of the eggs and the chicks. So we put out our boxes in January, and we've been checking them weekly. And as we check them, we just see if there's any nest development. And once a nest development starts, we put out a trail camera so we can monitor that nest development and look for images of uh, bluebirds going in to build that nest. And then we continue to monitor weekly until we see eggs. Um, so this, the video we're going to show is some of our monitoring um, and the different things we've seen in the nest boxes. Um, and that mostly was shot last week, um, so last Friday. Now, this Friday when we checked, we had a couple of eggs in some of our nests, so that was quite exciting. So we've got a little stills of those, but not video footage. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's see here. So in Florida, uh, bluebirds start building their nest uh, usually in February. Um, and it'll start with a few pine needles and grass material. Now, once they start, they usually uh, will be completed within five days. Uh, we've seen a little bit of variation in that. Um, some of the nests, I think, get a little started and then they change their minds um, and, and they don't finish it. We've seen one or two nests like that, but usually within five days. And they're gonna build this sort of cup shape uh, in the bottom of the nest box. Now, once that female, and it's the female that's doing the building, right? So the male finds the nest box or the nest cavity and then uh, perches on the nest box or, or around it and sings to attract a female. Once he's a, attracted a female, the female is actually building the nest. So the female builds that nest and she usually uh, completes it right within five to seven days. Now, about up to a week after she completes the nest, she's gonna start laying eggs. And she'll lay one egg a day, usually in the morning, uh, till she uh, finishes laying. And they'll lay an average of five eggs. And once she's finished laying, she starts incubating her eggs. So we can see that sort of cup shape, um, the way they uh, lay their eggs and their blue uh, oval eggs in the center of that cup. Now, uh, this was our first nest box to get a completed nest, uh, and we found that completed nest on the 19th. And once we saw evidence of that completed nest, well, well the week before we had seen a few sprigs and we thought, you know, I think they're going to be building a nest here. So we knew that the next week there would be potential for eggs to be in there. So we wanted to minimize our disturbance. So what we used, what I'm using there, is a bariscope camera that is Bluetoothed to my phone. So it's just allowing me a quick peek in. And so I'm not opening the door of the nest box and potentially letting some of that nesting material uh, fall out or fly out with the wind. And then we also had um, another nest, nest 6B, also had a completed nest on the 19th, but neither of those had eggs on the 19th. Now on the 26th, yesterday, we had two eggs in each nest. So that means, um, that they started, so they laid that second egg on the 26th and they laid their first egg on the 25th. So doing a bit of uh, back of the napkin type, type calculations, uh, we're thinking the nest will be completed around March 1st. She'll probably start incubating at that point. And we're looking at, at a potential hatch date of somewhere between March 13th and 15th. Um, and then those uh, hatchlings, once they fledge, they're gonna be fledging uh, at the end of March. So our next session, March 27th, we should have uh, um, some images uh, of these fledglings getting ready to fledge. 
and hopefully um, some other nests at different stages as well. Now, once you start seeing uh, some nest being develop, uh, developing in your box, it's important to, to identify what sort of species is actually building the nest. And luckily, a lot of uh, different species nest look different. So here's a, a common cavity nester that we might find here in Florida, and it's the tree swallow, right? So the tree swallow is building a cup, often with pine needles, um, but probably the best feature difference there is they line that cup with feathers and their eggs are white and they're smaller than bluebirds. So you can be on the lookout for those. And then we have wrens uh, down here in Florida. Now wrens will also build within the nest boxes. Uh, they're more likely to build a nest uh, in a nest box that's near a lot of trees. Uh, they're a little more tree dependent, um, but their nests uh, are twigs and grass. They're a bit messy and they could be a tunnel. And in fact, those house wrens will build potentially the entire, fill the entire nest box with nesting material. Their eggs are also smaller uh, than the bluebird's eggs and they're pinkish brown than speckled. The other bird that we might see cavity nesting, especially if the box is near a lot of trees, is a chickadee. So in, here in Florida, we have the Caroline chickadee. Uh, further north, we've got the black capped chickadee. Now these have an interesting nest where they uh, have, it's compact, so it's a lot lower, uh, and a lot smaller than the bluebird's nest, and it's mostly made of moss. And so you can see it looks quite different from the bluebird's egg-shaped uh, nest from twigs and pine. And the eggs, again, are speckled and white and smaller. And we can also have a uh, tufted titmouse. Uh, they also will uh, make their eggs, uh, their nest with moss, and it's a bit messy, uh, a little messier than the, than the chickadees as well. So be on the lookout for those. Now, all of these species we've shown so far, these are all native species. So if you find this nest uh, being constructed in your bluebird box, you should not remove it. Uh, you should let those birds raise those young, right? You can't remove it. That's, uh, these species are internationally protected. So, and you wouldn't want to, they're, they're native. Uh, so even though we want bluebirds, uh, other birds are good too. Now, conversely, we can find house sparrow nests in bluebird boxes. Now, house sparrows are invasive, they're non-native. Uh, they're, uh, they're aggressive towards bluebirds. They will force bluebirds out of an area and outcompete bluebirds. So if you find a house sparrow nest in your box, you would want to remove that nest and, and potentially take that down that box to prevent them from re-nesting. Um, so their nest, they make this sort of uh, pretty messy C-shaped nest, um, almost a little tunnelish uh, with grass and um, other materials. Now here at the center, we haven't seen any house sparrows uh, around. So we don't know if they're gonna be here or not, but you should definitely be on the watch for them, especially in suburban areas. And their eggs have that creamish or green color and they're uh, speckled with brown as well. Now you could also uh, get starlings. Now the best way to prevent starlings is to have a nest box with a hole that's too small for starlings to get in. And so that's smaller than nine and three, uh, three fourths an inch diameter. But starlings, if they get in, this is what their nest is gonna look like. Their starling eggs are a lot bigger than bluebird's eggs. Uh, they're about the size of a robin egg. And you'll want to take those down. So here is just a comparison uh, of the different eggs, uh, egg sizes that we've talked about uh, so far. So we have that robin egg at the top, right? That's the biggest egg. Um, and then the Eastern bluebird there on the, on the left. And then the house sparrow about the same size as the Eastern bluebird, but speckled in brown. And then tree swallow, nuthatch and house wren much smaller. And I really like these cutaway views of the nest box because it kind of helped really uh, drive home the differences in these nests. So as you're monitoring your bluebird box, look out for the nest design shape uh, to know what's nesting in there. And remove house sparrow nests if you get them um, and take down those boxes or do other sorts of uh, techniques for removing house sparrows. Now, we will also find uh, a lot of wasp in our nest boxes here. 
Now we're checking weekly. And uh, so often we, uh, the wasp, and this is a dark paper wasp, uh, the nest at their, the little uh, uh, wasp nest they're building there doesn't get too big because we're checking weekly. So what we'll do is we open up the box. If we see a wasp nest, uh, we sort of aggravate the wasp till he leaves. And then we take that nest down. So trying to discourage him from uh, building that nest there. Now, if you wait a bit longer, you're going to get a bigger, bigger nest like that image on the bottom, and then it's a bit more uh, problematic. Now, you can use wasp spray. I would really discourage you from spraying the, the nest box or anywhere near the nest box with wasp spray, but once you've uh, irritated the wasp, if you really wanted to <laughs> take him out, you could try spraying, but just make sure you're away from the nest box. And in most cases, we, we're not using spray. We're just uh, deterring uh, the wasp out of the box and removing its nest and continuing to check because they do come back. Um, you can also get a mouse building a nest in a box. Bluebirds will not go in these nest boxes if there's wasp or mouses in them. So you want to remove those for sure. Now, uh, we can get some additional resources uh, from the Florida Bluebird Society, which is helping support this project. Uh, They've got a website with a lot of great resources. Uh, Cialis.org uh, is an information site about bluebirds, and that's the, based on the Latin name of the uh, bluebirds genus. And then, of course, the North American Bluebird Society as well has a lot of good information. Now, there are some basic principles that it's important to, uh, to follow when you're monitoring your nest boxes and checking on them. And so the first one and the most important one is always put the interest of the birds first. So be conscious of their welfare at all times. Make sure you're not stressing them out. Um, you want to be good stewards of these nest boxes. So consider the impact of your activities on the birds before, before you take too many actions, right? Don't check too frequently. Don't disturb them too frequently. Um, we do our checks in the late morning and afternoon because bluebirds are more active on their nest in terms of building and egg laying in the morning. So we don't want to disturb that at all. Uh, so we do that our checks in the, in the late morning and the afternoon. We also don't want to check those boxes and don't want to open them up when it's raining or windy. When it's too windy, uh, that sort of change in pressure um, will uh, blow out some nesting material and that could uh, not be good for the, for the bluebirds. It might discourage them from uh, continuing to build that nest. So I uh, just want to take a second. I'm seeing a couple of comments and questions coming in about some different species that have also built nests in some of their bluebird nest boxes, like the great crested uh, flycatcher. So that's a native species uh, protected. So of course, don't remove that nest. Uh, but yeah, uh, can get a little crowded. And then also uh, flying squirrels and bats. Um, I would also not, uh, I would discourage you from removing those as well. Um, those are all native, uh, native animals, so don't want to remove those. Of course, often mice, uh, it's often a, a house mouse, so you can remove those. Now, uh, the third principle there is ensure that the nest boxes uh, that you're providing for your birds are safe. And so how do we do that? Well, we provide predator guards uh, and we keep the wasp and, and house mice and starlings and um, house sparrows out of them. And then obey the protection laws on birds. So uh, migrating birds like bluebirds, they're protect, protected by international treaty. So you can't touch their nest, their eggs, or, their, or the birds themselves. You can't harm them. You can't remove them. You can't cause loss. Um, so don't want to do that with bluebirds or any native species. Um, for our study, we have applied for uh, special permissions to, to monitor those eggs and the nestlings. But right now, we're not doing any of that. We're using cameras to look in the nest. So we really want to minimize that disturbance. And that, that goes to our fifth principle, which, of course, is keep disturbance to a minimum. Only open that nest box when it's necessary to collect the data. And right now, we're using the bariscope camera, so we don't even have to open it once that nest is complete. And the Florida Bluebird Society has got a nice a nest box monitoring protocol on their website. So. Uh, before we go to our video, which is just some footage of us checking the nest uh, uh, last Friday, I want to highlight again our upcoming sessions. So we've got our next session on the 27th 
And this is the one I'm going to be I'm really excited about because we're going to have, I suspect, uh, a lot of different nests with a lot of different age birds and eggs in those nests. So I'm looking forward to that next session at the end of March. Um, the eggs that we found yesterday, uh, those will be almost ready to fledge by the end of March. And then we'll have another session in April uh, and in May and in June. So let me uh, switch to our video here. See, this nest box is empty. There's nothing okay, uh, happening in this nest box so far. That works. So we'll close it Great. back up. We'll mark that down on our sheet. What's going on? And we'll keep uh, checking our boxes. All right, so we're at nest box 15. And so we're going to, this is a NABS box, so it's going to open on the side. So we're going to pull this nail out. And we're going to open it up and we're going to see uh, what is inside. All right, so we're going to pull our nail out and then we're just going to open it up a crack here just in case there's anything in. We don't want to open it too wide. And so what we see there is a, a few little uh, sprigs, a few little pieces of perhaps the start of a nest. So let's close it back up and hopefully they'll continue to build a nest here. So this is one of our gills. Uh, this box is 16B. And with the gills, uh, the way you would actually formally check the box would be to squeeze here and pull down. But we don't want to disturb too much unless it's necessary. And, and so if you're tall or average height like me, you can sort of peek in and see there's nothing in here. But when I peek up this way, there is a wasp up here. And so we don't want a wasp in the nest because that's going to detract from the birds nesting there. So we're going to remove this wasp. So I'm going to gently pull down here, and there he is. He hasn't created a nest yet, but we still want him out of there. So we have a substantial uh, wasp, uh, paper wasp nest here inside this NABS box. And so we're going to remove it. It's right up there in the corner, so it's a bit hard to see. So we're here at uh, nest box 2A. And last week, nest box 2A had a, a fair amount of uh, nesting material in it. So I think there's going to be a full-fledged nest in here. So we're going to use our baroscope camera to take a peek inside, hopefully minimizing the disturbance, uh, so not opening the door. So this little baroscope camera is Bluetooth. Let's dig it in there and see what we can see, see if we have full nest, if we've got eggs. Doesn't look like we have any eggs yet. This is definitely a full blown nest. Probably ready to have eggs at any moment. So we'll keep our eyes on this one. So, another thing that we're uh, doing with a lot of our nest boxes is we've set up trail cameras on them, especially on nest boxes that are showing signs of a nest developing. And so we've got this uh, the camera set up. It's taking a shot of the nest box. It's going to have all the way to below the predator guard and all the way to the top. So we'll see any sort of predator, potential predator interference. But what we're also going to be able to see is the bluebird coming in and out of the nest box and building that nest box. And hopefully we'll see fledglings come out as well once we get to that point. But these uh, trail cams need to be checked weekly. And so we've got a little data sheet where we check them, we exchange their camera, uh, their memory cards, and we put fresh batteries in them. So making sure that they're always uh, taking images. And so the way to check the camera is we just pop this open. And we can flip a switch to turn it off um, and pop the memory card out. And then we'll switch it back into test mode and we'll navigate the menu to make sure our, all our settings are still good and the battery is still good. And then we'll turn it back on and close it up. 
and it's ready to go. So what we were seeing a lot of that video was from last Friday on the 19th. And so we didn't yet have eggs uh, in those nests and now they do. They've got three eggs as of today, both of those. So one of those, um, and um, what we were seeing with some of our, uh, our trail cams there. So in the first video, we ha had a female coming in and she was actually uh, working on building uh, building uh, the nest and so it was building the female was building the nest on some of those video footages and then the second one the one that had a bit of noise that actually the male was was perched on top of the uh, the trail cam because it's that one's in a field without any post for the trail cam to be put up on so it's actually just on t post the trail cam and the male's using that as a perch to hang out as the female was building the nest now the trail cam, we use a, a couple of different type of trail cams. We uh, recently bought uh, several new ones. Uh, there's it's a new brand called Vicary. Uh, we got it off of Amazon. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, they don't have an iPhone app that I know of. Uh, some of the newer trail cams do, and that's something that we might look into. Um, but the reason we're uh, the primary reason we're checking that trail cam is to make sure that the batteries are still good and switching out um, uh, the memory cards because some of these boxes uh, the trail cams are in view of cattle and so we get a lot of images of cattle moving back and forth triggering the motion and then so we're using a predator guard uh, the stovepipe baffle and so uh, it, out here it's it's fairly windy and even with turning down our sensitivity we still get a lot of stills and videos of the um, uh, stovepipe baffle, baffle just moving in the wind. Um, someone had mentioned using the IBWO wireless cavity camera. I think that's something uh, that we should look into. Uh, we're not using those uh, right now, but something worth looking into for sure. Um, and then we had a question about predator guards. Working, which predator guard works best for snakes? So for our project, we're using these stovepipe baffles. I think they're gonna be pretty good at preventing snakes from coming up. You know, other researchers I've seen, uh, they'll grease their poles. Um, and then you can also use uh, wider baffles as well to prevent uh, snakes from climbing up. There's pretty much, so we've cut our, the, the hole that we cut into the center of the stovepipe baffles pretty tight. So I don't think any snakes would fit through the hole between the, the um, PVC pipe and the baffle itself, but we had to do a little extra duct tape as well to make that even tighter. Uh, so we're fairly confident 
that no snakes are going to get through. But the way that we position these cameras is so that we get a full view of the nest box and the predator guard. So hopefully we're going to be able to capture images or video of any predators, raccoons, uh, snakes, etc., from trying to approach uh, the nest box from the bottom, but also uh, aerial predators trying to approach it from the top. And then I think there was also a question about the uh, the baroscope camera. So we, uh, that was uh, just a, a baroscope camera we got again off of Amazon, uh, and it Bluetooths with with my phone, uh, and that allows me to take images and videos uh, from it. Uh, it's got a little light at the end uh, of the camera so that it helps illuminate inside the box a little bit. And I'll, I'll have to look and see uh, if there if there's any difference between that type of camera and the endoscope camera. I suspect they're similar. So yeah, I think that answers the questions that I've, I can see here. Um, oh, and another context about the video at the end. So we saw that was actually, it was pretty excited. That was the same day last Friday that we were checking nest boxes when we saw just 40 something vultures in the field, the mostly black vultures, a couple of turkeys. And then when we got closer, we saw in the tree that there was a bald eagle, uh, adult bald eagle and a crested caracara perched in the tree. And so they were actually attracted to some pigs that had been dispatched in that pasture. Um, and so pretty neat to see the caracara out here. I mean, they're certainly around, but that's the first one I've seen at the center. So I was pretty excited about that. Oh, we've got an interesting tip here. Uh, to stop the baffle from blowing in the wind, you could use two metal strips that have holes in them and place the inside top of the baffle, use the screws to attach the metal pieces together and they should be cut for inner diameter of box. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I would definitely appreciate uh, a, a photo of that. I think that would be great. Uh, <laughs> a lot of our images and videos, especially in some of the windier areas uh, out here, are a lot of the baffle moving. Um, so yeah, if we can if we can cut down on that because that's eating up both battery and, and memory space, um, that would be great. And then another uh, good tip here, using ivory soap on the top and upper sides of the box to prevent wafts. That's an interesting thing. I, I wanna look into it and see if there's any negative effects on bluebirds. I suspect not, uh, but uh, it's definitely worth looking into that. And I wanna reiterate that you definitely don't wanna use any sort of wasp spray uh, anywhere near the box, uh, cause that could be bad for bluebirds and the eggs or the nestlings. Um, now, so a little bit of, I guess, of, a, of uh, an update. So we were checking the, a lot of the video right is from Friday. So on Friday, last Friday, the 19th, we had two completed nests and a couple of nests that were just getting started. And those uh, other nests that were just getting started, one's full blown and I expect eggs are gonna come into that nest uh, sometime in the, in the coming week. And then we had two really interesting Yes, so both the NABs and the Florida Bluebird Society box right next to each other at the same site, both have early stages of a nest. Uh, one's a bit ahead of the other, but it looks like they're both going to turn into full nest. But this site uh, is actually one of our sites that's pretty far from any of the trees. And driving on that site uh, so far on all the checks, I haven't seen any bluebirds, but I've seen a lot of swallows and so a lot of tree swallows. So I'm wondering if that's gonna develop into a tree swallow, into tree swallow nest. So I'm gonna keep an eye on that one. Um, yeah, so we are keeping track, but right now uh, in terms of which nests are going into which type of boxes, uh, right now we have nests in Florida Bluebird Society boxes and in NABs boxes. We don't have any nests in Gilbertson's, yes. Uh, yet at one point we had a couple of strands in one Gilbertson, uh, but that, that hasn't progressed. So I, I don't think uh, anyone's actively building a nest in the Gilbertson right now, but I still feel it's early. I feel like we're probably on the, 
uh, on the uh, uh, left side of the bell curve in terms of uh, nest building and uh, egg laying. But uh, yeah, by March 27th, we're gonna have uh, a fair amount of nest, I suspect. So one of the things that we will be looking into is the effect of heat. Um, so uh, we've got some I button temperature uh, loggers and we're gonna be deploying those. What we're, we're waiting though, um, so we don't want to disturb the nest too much. We don't want to uh, cause the bluebirds to abandon that nest. So you know, we're keeping a close eye on those nests, so those ones that have eggs in them now. We're gonna put those loggers in uh, right before the hatch date or, uh, yeah, right before the hatch date, because we want the entire nestling period uh, to, to be monitored temperature-wise. So we're gonna be recording temperature for the entire nestling period uh, every 15 minutes with these loggers. We're gonna uh, affix them to the, to the back of the box right above uh, the nest or right at nest level. Um, but we don't wanna open up the box too early and potentially cause an, an abandonment. So we're, we're waiting a little bit longer for that. But yeah, we're definitely gonna be looking into heat. I, I suspect that that's gonna be one of the big differences between uh, the NAB, the NABs and the Florida Bluebird Society, which are all wood, and the Gilbertson boxes. I mean, uh, there was a earlier study in uh, Gainesville, in and around Gainesville, uh, that compared Petersons to NABs uh, in, or Petersons to Gilbertsons and found that Petersons were a lot hotter internally uh, or substantially hotter than, uh, than Gilbertsons. Uh, a couple other uh, suggestions here. Dichotomous earth to prevent insect predation in the nest. Uh, I can look into that um, and, and see. And then uh, a metal plate around and below the predator guard to prevent woodpeckers from getting into the box. Um, it, it hasn't stopped the bluebirds from using the box, but might not be recommended. So there are, you can put those um, mesh, so you can do two things to prevent woodpeckers uh, from enlarging your holes uh, and making them accessible, and in the end, effectively making them accessible to starlings. And so one is putting metal plate with a hole right around uh, the nest box entrance so that the woodpeckers can't peck and make the entrance larger. Another uh, thing you can do to sort of, and this can also uh, act as a predator guard as well, sort of a mesh cage around the nest box entrance as well. Um, that's gonna prevent a little bit of the woodpecker from enlarging the hole. It's also gonna prevent uh, some predators from being able to reach in or, or uh, climb into the nest box. Yeah, so we have been on the lookout for fire ants. This was something where there's a lot of fire ant nests uh, on the property out here, but it was something we were actively making sure that we weren't putting any nest boxes near fire ant mounds. Um, some of them are probably um, 10 feet from a fire ant mound. It's something we've recorded uh, and we keep note of, um, but we did try to avoid putting them anywhere directly near it. Not only uh, does that prevent any predation by fire ants or help reduce that risk, but it also uh, makes sure that we don't step in fire ant nests or put some of our equipment in fire ant nests when we're working. I have done that once. Uh, so I'm not from Florida and I've only been in Florida for about, uh, for about three months now. And so uh, I did get my first official fire ant bite. I got about 15 where I, when I'd set some equipment for another project, sort of haphazard, ha hazardly on the ground and wasn't paying attention. And so I got about 15 bites. So I have experienced fire ants um, and we are on the lookout for them uh, around nests. If we do uh, detect any of those, we're gonna try to remove those uh, mounds using uh, hot water to sort of uh, destroy that nest. Yeah, I did not mention, but uh, that's something that we do do, especially with the completed nest when we approach. We sort of give a little knock on the side of the box before we stick anything or peek into that hole. Um, uh, so we don't want uh, a bluebird flying out into our face, and we want to give a bluebird, if it is on the nest or in the box, a chance to escape. But uh, we are doing that. Often we'll see 
uh, with the completed nest, we will see the bluebirds hanging out perched near it uh, before we even approach the nest. Uh, and we are trying to do our checks in the late morning, uh, you know, usually around 11 or later uh, to sort of avoid any uh, morning disturbance. Um, there is a suggestion on using andro to kill the fire ant male nest uh, instead of just hot water, which would just send them away. I want to look into that. Um, yeah, I want to look into I'm always a little weary of using chemicals. Uh, that's probably a big reason why I'm not using uh, wasp spray in and around the, the nest box as well. But I, I, I will look into that about using chemicals to, to take care of ant, fire ants. Uh, fire ants are a big problem for a lot of bird species. Uh, uh, if you guys are aware of the Florida grasshopper sparrows, ground nesting bird, and one of its big predators. Uh, uh, so Florida grasshopper sparrows threatened. Um, there's not very many of them left. And uh, one of the big predators of their nest, uh, which is one of the drivers of the population decline, is fire ants. So there's lots of uh, active research in different parts of the uh, Florida looking at ways to help protect Florida grasshopper sparrow from fire ants. Um, so I think I covered uh, all the questions. Really excited for next week. And we're going to be shooting video pretty much all this month, uh, hopefully getting uh, some video with those Veriscope cameras and some of the trail camera footage to sort of really get a good look at some of these nests developing and activity at the nest. And excited to look at some of our trail camera footage for those nests that I suspect could be tree swallows. Uh, the trail cam will confirm that. So we'll be able to see who's actually going in and building those nests. We just pulled the, the memory cards uh, yesterday though. So we haven't had a chance to look over them yet. All right, uh, any other questions? Um, okay. Great. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Um, we'll send an email about uh, this uh, video being posted online. Uh, if you go to, if you Google the Range Cattle Research and Education Center, you'll find uh, our, our center's website. And if you, from there, you can navigate to the virtual classroom, which has videos, all our videos we've done. And we're also, occasionally we post little short updates. We've got a video there that has uh, sort of a 360 view at every nest box site. So you can sort of see a little bit of the variability of our nest box sites. So some of them are uh, more in the pastures and a bit further away from trees than others. Um, and we've also got a few other little short videos there. We're gonna be posting some documents. I hope to post uh, the study out of Gainesville that looked at the Petersons and Gilbertson. Um, and then we'll be posting uh, data sheets. Uh, so we encourage you, if you've got your own bluebird uh, nest box or nest box trail, to, to collect data using NestWatch and, and, and uh, report that data to NestWatch. So we'll post uh, some information there as well. All right. Thanks for coming, guys.